thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, Very welcome. Where are you I, based? Um, so based in Chicago, but originally I'm a, I'm a transplant from Europe as well. So originally from the UK, as you can probably tell by the accent. Oh, of course, I can hear that. I yeah. live between New York and London, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, we've been here, we've been in Chicago for nine years, actually, this year. So I've kind of just accepted that the accent, the English accent's never, never going to leave me. <laughs> right, yeah, that doesn't leave easily. <laughs> um, so I guess a little bit about the, the website, really, we just, we try and speak to, um, really people across the spectrum in music. So it could be musicians, producers, managers, uh, venue owners, any of that. So I'm quite excited to speak to you sort of as a producer and an engineer. And I guess like starting out, what I wanted to ask you is like, how did music come into your life? When did it start for you as a, as a child? I guess were you a musician first? Yeah, I started when I was 17 as a musician. Um, yeah. I was playing the keys at the time, and I just uh, had an interest in recording the rehearsals. Hmm. Uh, so I bought some gear to do that. First, some microphones, then a mixing desk. Uh, eventually, you know, the equipment started growing and accumulating until yeah. I decided that maybe that was the path I needed to pursue. And I opened the recording studio in my parents' basement <laughs> in Sicily, where I lived at the time. Uh, I was 17, and I was yeah. running first commercial recording space uh, and it kind of took off from there yeah yeah 17 is a is a young age to kick off with your own studio effectively yeah yeah it is but you got to start and yeah I, you know, I had energy and wanted to do things and so I did yeah and then so was it um was it a case of the the sort of music in terms of playing in bands and, and things like that just tailed off as you focus more on the recording um, I kind of just, uh, I was busy recording my band's, uh, my, my band's rehearsals. And then yeah. I wanted, uh, I just, uh, decided that I should do this with more bands with other people as well. Yeah. That's when I, when I opened the re recording studio. Yeah. Okay. And then how, how long was it then before you made the jump to, so was the, and was the idea when you moved to the U S just to pursue this further and, and take it further is, you know, cause that's yeah. where you could do that. When I moved to the US, I wanted to, um, to do an internship at Eastside Sound, the studio yeah. that now, you know, run. You know, yeah. Uh, the idea at the time was just to be there as an intern to learn and then go back to Italy. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, New York blew my mind. And so I just stayed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know the feeling actually. Chicago is, uh, has done that to me and, and music, I mean, I, I, my job is not music, but music played a big part in it because this is just such a great city for live music. Yeah. And, and actually, and I'm jumping around a bit here, one of the things I did want to ask you about because uh, looking into your background and everything, you've worked with Buddy Guy. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about what that experience was like because for me, it's been a real treat to live in Chicago and be able to go every January to his club and see him perform live. You know, still, he's still doing it. He's like 82 and he plays four or five nights every week in January as a residency. Um, yeah, Chicago a, a year or two ago and I went to see the show again. I yeah. had never been in Chicago. I had seen Buddy Guy play, but never in his own venue in Chicago. I forget, what is the venue called? Legends. Legends, right. Yeah. Uh, but and it's it's just what you'd expect, right? That venue, it's it, there's no frills. It's like, you know, the staff that work for him have all worked for him for years and years. So uh, you know, everybody knows everybody in the club, and the club is just like plastic seats and tables and a bar. It's not it's not yeah, fancy. I've been. <laughs> I've been. So yeah. what I do remember about the session with Buddy Guy is that it was the uh, earliest session I ever had to do because he had, he had a, an interview in a radio that morning in a morning show and so he asked for the session to be at 7 a.m. <laughs> that was that was insane to me you know most rockers are always getting up at 11 or 12 or that's yeah. when 
record at least. So I, it'll go down in history for me as being the earliest recording session I've ever done. Um, so yeah. And what, what was his, in terms of actually recording him, at the time you did that, and I don't know what year it was, but what was his, was he relatively like old school in what he expected? Was it to tape? Was it still using? I think I, I think I was using Pro Tools, pretty sure, yeah. not tape. But I do remember that he requested uh, two amps to be rented for him. One of them I remember was the Fender Bassman. Yeah. I think the other amp was. So we rented those two amps for him and he played his guitar that he brought through the rental amp. So the amp choice was definitely old school in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but everything else, you know, was recorded in a modern, so to speak, way, yeah. Pro Tools, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really it, it, like I say, it's great living in the place where he is because he, he really is. I mean, I guess now, um, one of the last originals in that in that sort of sense. But uh, yeah, so I guess I mean, and I'm saying I'm jumping around, going back. So how did so you went seeking an internship? I guess did that happen when you came to New York? You got the internship and then just built from there. Correct. I I got the internship at Eastside Sound, and then I just proved my worth and kept escalating my position from intern, runner, assistant, uh, yeah. engineer, and chief engineer. Now I'm basically the chief engineer and I also co-manage the studio. So uh, I'm in a very fav favorable position. Excellent. And I think, um, so talking about more recently what you've been involved in, obviously the big uh, sort of project was, was Angel Headed Hipster. Um, yeah. which is a, it's like a Mark Ball and, and T-Rex kind of tribute but the list of people who performed on that was is unbelievable I mean that must have been quite the experience for you getting to work with such a wide and varied sort of selection of artists correct it was a, a an incredible honor to work with all those artists it took four years yeah. of my um uh but it was for very and stressful at times, but very enjoyable uh, years of my professional life. Yeah. Uh, the guidance of Hal Wilner, who was the producer of the record. He was the one that was selecting all the artists and uh, assigning or selecting what song would work best for that artist in that yeah. context. And then he would basically tell me, we're doing this artist in this city and we would look for a studio together. Um, he had preferences for studios, obviously, but oftentimes, oftentimes I was left with the choice of uh, choosing a studio. Yeah. Uh, which uh, and so most most of the sessions happened between Los Angeles and New York, with yeah. some that happened in Chicago, in New Orleans, in pa in France, different places in <laughs> France. So it was kind of all over the place. And, and Hallett kind of, as I understand it, that was his thing, right? He put together a lot of sort of collaborations with a lot of artists over the years. That was one of the things he enjoyed doing. So I guess you were in good hands if it was him sort of, you know, taking the lead on putting that together. Absolutely. I mean, Hal and I had worked for several years before this project. Yeah. Uh, he had done several other records together and a lot of shows. So we go back, you know, at least 10 years. Yeah. I met through Lou Reed, Hal was also Lou Reed's producer, and I worked with Lou Reed for this last seven years of my life. Yeah. So Hal and I were close. We grew even closer doing this project. We became very good friends. So it was an extremely sad loss when he died of COVID in April. Yeah, what a terrible uh, situation that is. We're, we're still in at the moment and seems to be getting worse, but you know. I am. Um, uh, I guess in, in that respect and in terms of the album, how did you approach, you know, as I said, it's like it's a very wide range of artists. I think I've read that you you have a preference, I guess, for recording live, but having people in isolation so that they can see each other, but they may be in isolation booths. I guess the video I saw um, of one of the tracks, which was Nick Cave, I think, it did look like everybody was in, in the room. So was it a mix of, you know, if you could find a studio where you could isolate people, was that your preference? Yes. Um, the, my, preference, uh, my preference is 
to record in isolation, but mm -hmm. every at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and so when I research a studio, I usually research a studio that that has that uh, capability. Village Orders Studio D um, in uh, Los Angeles, where we recorded Borns, for example, among yeah. others, and video of that. Uh, that's one of my favorite in Los Angeles. And in New York, one of my favorite is East Side Sound, where I mix the entire record, because that ha that studio has six ISO boots. Uh, but most of the sessions we did either at Village Recorders in LA or at Sear Sound in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and to answer your question about the isolation on the Nick Cave song that you see the video of, uh, that was the very first session that we did, and we were still kind of figuring out what worked best for this for for the record or, or yeah. for the vibe. So that that session was actually done, everyone um, in the same room, uh, except for the drums that are in the back booth of that room. Yeah. So everyone at the same time, like. Uh, Lou, uh, I mean, Nick was singing and playing the piano at the same time next to the string section in front of him, yeah. guitar players, and in the only ISO booth that Studio A yeah. had, that Studio A of Village Recorders, we put the drums. Yeah, it, it, it always, it, it fascinates me when I do talk to musicians these days and, 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 and some producers and things like that, the, the difference the different perspectives people have. You know, obviously technology is impacting everything now. And I think in, in positive ways and negative ways, and then you still have people who want to be super traditional and record to tape. I do think, I, I have noticed from a lot of musician interviews that I've done more recently, there does seem to be much more of a preference for recording live. So everyone playing at the same time, it, it seems to, have come back around to that, you know, rather than having people tracking separately and, and things like that. There seems to be a recognition that maybe you get something a little bit different or a little bit extra when everybody's playing together. Yeah, I'm hoping that we come back around to that as an industry. I think there's an incredible uh, energy and, um, and organic vibe that you can only achieve in that way, yeah. you know, a whole band plays together, everyone vibes of, off of each other. The drummer, the bass player, and vice versa. And all those subtle little, ch subtle little changes that, uh, that uh, take place when there's yeah. that interaction are really what makes live performed music what it is. And yeah. if you do it one instrument at a time, you lose that. Yeah. And, and I think in some senses, <coughs> Some of the little imperfections that get introduced as well in terms of the musicians themselves, right? Maybe the tempo is a little bit up and down as you get in towards a chorus or something like that, but everybody's playing together. And it, I always like going back and listening to all the records. Like I always particularly notice it on Led Zeppelin records, right? Where there are, there are little scratches, there are little things that you hear in there that for a period of time that would never have got, you know, in more recent times, that would have all been taken out. It would have all gone and it's like but it adds to the vibe of those records so much okay yeah i mean i i totally agree with you uh in fact if you listen to those old records led zeppelin but many others you'll yeah. hear of small little imperfections and yeah. i don't think wrong with that that's part yeah. of music part of being a human that performs music yeah uh, you know, if you want it without imperfections, then you can have the computer do it, but if it's not going to sound the same. It's not going to feel the same. It yeah. doesn't, personality doesn't have, you know, I mean, I keep using the word vibe, which is, is a little yeah. overused, but you get, <laughs> you kind of lose all of that if you're yeah, doing there's, there's definitely something intangible, I think, is the thing, isn't it? There's something extra there. Um, it was, it, I remember watching a, they were getting the different perspectives on, on recording techniques and things like that. I thought it was really, there was a really interesting, I think it was a Foo Fighters documentary and it was the one where Dave Grohl had wanted to go back and do record everything to tape. And, it, and I was listening and I was thinking some of the things that came out were interesting. I remember Butch Vig saying to the guys, if you guys want to record this to tape, you need to really know your parts because like we can't just run up a lot of tape with you guys making mistakes. 
Um, and then, as, I don't know if it was that same documentary or as part of another, you got like this polar opposite view from, um, who was it they had on there? Oh, I, I can't, did I write down who it was? Uh, oh, it was Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. And he had this like totally opposite view. He's like, oh, they're recording to tip. He's like, I use Pro Tools as kind of an instrument. And like he uses all the capabilities of Pro Tools as like a creative a creative tool rather yeah. than just a recording tool. Um, and it was it was really interesting to me, like hearing those two viewpoints. Um, yeah, I, I see it like Trent in the sense that for me, Pro Tools is an instrument and it's my yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic tool of creation, Pro Tools. Yeah. But I, you know, what you said about the quote, the Butchwick quote is totally true. Yeah. Uh, or to tape, you have to know what you're doing. You can redo a take, but you can't fix with the same level of, uh, you know, detail that you can on Pro Tools. Yeah. And it, at that level of detail, I'm not against editing at all. Yeah. Uh, but I am for playing organically and playing as a as a as a band as an ensemble. You know? Yeah, I get. I guess it adds that element in as well. If you're playing as a band, that you know, and, and I've spoken to a few musicians about that, and, and particularly sort of guys who've done session work, which is, you know, they see people that when that red light goes on like they, they can be great live or something like that. And when the red light goes on, it's a totally different story. I think there's an element to that to it as yeah, well. Of course. Everyone, they tend to play, <laughs> they tend to play faster or they tend to play loud sometimes, you know, yeah. sometimes it's good. There's nothing wrong with it, but uh, it's, it's part of being a, a human. Like I said, you know, it's like, we want to be human. We want to bring humanity back into music. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of um, your career, and obviously you're the, the chief engineer out there and, and, and managing the studio, do you find yourself moving in any different direction? Are you moving more towards producing? Um, or, it, you know, I know you do some front of house stuff as well, right, in live. So you really keep it, uh, keep it quite varied in terms of what you do. Yes, absolutely. I like variety. In fact, mm -hmm. I think, you know, they say, the famous saying is variety is the spice of life. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Uh, so I tend to uh, try to surround myself with different type of music in my life. I have a very easy way uh, interfacing with different types of music. I don't feel like I'm a fish out of water, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, there are genres that I'm better at and genres that I know better yeah. uh, than but in general, I think it's great to be able to, to to work in different genres if you if if you like the genre. If you don't like yeah. the genre, it's gonna come natural, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I work in metal, jazz, rock. Uh, you know, I don't do a lot of R and B, hip hop, and things like that. Yeah. But I work in classical music, new music experimental music electronic music industrial music so the basically the genres that i listen to all the time are the yeah. genres I feel comfortable recording and mixing uh or producing when i work as a producer yeah and it seems like you like to i mean just listening to you there just challenge yourself as well anyway and i know i think it was mentioned when i was looking at your background that you do you know like enjoy trying to record sort of maybe non-traditional instruments and things like that and the challenge that that provides to you what, yes. what's uh, and I, off the back of that i would say so what's the most challenging instrument you find in terms of recording um that's an interesting question i recorded all sorts of crazy instruments you know there's an artist in new york called uh kenny wallison he's a fantastic drummer yeah. uh, player but also what's interesting about Kenny is that he builds his own instruments and yeah. he, these instruments are usually percussive, but oftentimes they're, they're also crank up machines where he cranks them and they make certain types of sounds yeah. and Butler, but he does it most, mostly with guitars. Anyway, Kenny Wallison is an inventor with an, you know, amazing imagination yeah. for being instruments that make sound. And I've had the pleasure of recording him 
over the course of multiple days where he would basically show up with a truck. Yeah. Uh, truck would have, would be filled to the gills with instruments. And I'm talking like a big truck, not just a little van. <laughs> yeah. Commercial sized delivery truck. And he would unload instruments for like two hours. Yeah. And then record every, in, every single instrument. And those instruments have then been used on records by John Zorn and things like that. So he's he's a very he's a very unique character, Kenny, and I love his creation of instruments. And I think some of the weirdest ones are definitely one, the ones that he's he's invented. Yeah, yeah. And you you mentioned John there. You seem, I mean, you talked about working with Hal. You seem to have an extremely close relationship with with John as well. Uh, with John, yeah, with, I've worked with John for over ten years, and John is a very prolific guy. So yeah, when, ten years. Uh, it's it's kind of like it's it's sort of like the life of cats you know they say seven what is it seven years yeah. uh, one human year and it's, <laughs> it's the same with Zorn it's like working with Zorn for 10 years is the equivalent of working with Zorn with a normal artist for 70 years yeah. so born in those 10 years we've done over 100 records together um, yeah. and in fact we're doing another one tomorrow uh, so he's constantly he's super creative. He never stops writing music, and he's he's got an endless uh, cre endless force of creation within him that yeah. I am fortunate enough to be allowed to be around and help him uh, come to fruition with my with my engineering skills. Yeah. And I guess I mean currently current environment how. Has it, uh, I guess it must have impacted you in a sense in terms of it might have been difficult to have bands in the studio with some of the restrictions. Oh. Are you still um, finding that work is, is coming? Uh, work has definitely slowed down. Yeah. Uh, so I, it's, it hasn't, you know, it's, it's definitely affected everyone and the impact on the industry is, is, is going to be long lasting and yeah, it is. devastating. Um, we have reopened Eastside Sound, the recording studio that I mentioned on, um, on July 1st, and we restarted doing sessions. Now, the beauty of Eastside Sound uh, is that it has all the ISO boots that I was mentioning before, and so it's yeah. actually easy to stay, uh, to stay isolated, to practice that safe social distancing that, yeah. that is now a requirement or at least a recommendation. So at Eastside, we're able to do sessions uh, where everyone is in a different room uh, and therefore they can be in the same room and use a mask or they can be in these separate rooms that have separate air conditioning and even remove their masks if they feel, um, you know, if they feel better playing that way. Uh, so Mara, for example, mm -hmm. we're doing with Zorn, uh, where every one of the musicians will be in a different booth. And so we found we find keep working around the pandemic and continue making music. Yeah, that, that's great. And I was going to ask you as well, I mean, in terms of, we talked a little bit that, you know, you do, you obviously do a lot of recording in the studio and then you have, you know, some front of house. And I think you've been quite involved in a lot of concert recording kind of scenarios. What are the, do you have a preference or what are the challenges that are unique to live recording? Because I often notice a lot of bands get very tied to their front of house guys. Um, I was talking to, it was, it was Tommy Emmanuel the other day, and obviously when he goes on tour, it's just him. But he has yeah. this one guy who has always done his front of house. He's like, that's the guy who gets the sound that I want. Um, yeah. Do you, do you really enjoy, do you enjoy doing the front of house stuff? I do enjoy it. And it's a matter of loyalty, really. Yeah talking about is loyalty which i think is a great thing on the part of the artists towards yeah. their sound engineer um i mean i have that with zorn he's never used another sound engineer live other than me since yeah. on each other um so uh, the, the the what's special about that kind of relationship that you're describing is that people really you know engineers really know what the artist expects and, and what the artist wants to hear and how they want to work. And that makes it much more comfortable for the artist. And so when the artist is able to 
uh, to have the person that they're comfortable if they can in turn relax. Yeah. Uh, now, if you take that to a, to the next level, somebody uh, like Zorn and I or Lou Reed and I, where we work together in the studio and we work together live, yeah. that relationship is height, height, heightened even more so by the fact that you know each other so well from working in the studio. You know, you know each other's body language. I know his body. I know when he conducts, what he wants, what he means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It makes it even easier for me to give him what he wants. Yeah. Uh, I do enjoy live sound, and I enjoy the challenges that come with it. Some of you mentioned the word challenge. Some of the challenges are, of course, that you have to get everything done in a much more stringent and shorter amount of time. You have yeah. sound to make it work, uh, but you and you have to make it work in that time. It's not like, and also you can't ask the musicians to repeat something a million times like you yeah. would, you know, on Pro Tools, you can just loop something or you can play something a million times. Yeah. Live, you have only so many times until they need to move on to something else or you need to move on to something else. Yeah. So I'd say the biggest challenge is time, uh, but also the other huge challenge of doing live sound is the constantly changing variables that are part of doing your job you know you have a different console every night you have a different venue every night a different speaker set every night everything is like different yeah. from next there's no there's no um there's just no uh consistency yeah. uh and, and like you have in the studio and so that's that's a big challenge but i enjoy it i think Variety is the spice of life, so I like doing both. I think people underestimate how important that role is. And, you know, you can see it around Chicago. I definitely have, when I go to watch live music, I have the venues where they're my favorite rooms to listen to music in because some rooms just j just sound better. And I think that's, that's true. What I was going to ask you is, in that kind of relationship you talked about where you're working with an artist, you know, like maybe Nick Cave or, or Lou Reed in the studio and doing live sound for you. Does that help you maybe push what you'd normally do on the live side? So when you're recording, might you do something with one eye on this, we can do this in the studio and it might sound great live, or, you know, we're gonna try something live that we've done on this record in the studio, which I wouldn't try with someone who I didn't work with in the studio, that kind of creative. Yeah. I mean, I don't really, I don't really think of in terms of reproducing something live or in the studio. Mm. Um, I don't really, it's not a consideration that I make when we're working in the studio. Yeah. Uh, more about the relationship between me and the artist yeah. that, that, you know, takes advantage of knowledge and experience rather than something in the music, because in the music, you can always change things and the band live might be different than it was in the studio. So I try not let that be a factor. Okay. So I guess, I, I mean, I know we're coming up on, on 30 minutes. I just wanted to sort of maybe catch up on, so what you're doing at the moment, any exciting projects? I think we saw that you're doing, the, the one that interested me that I saw was that you've got something with some throat singers and um, some metal musicians that you're working on at the moment. I wonder if you yeah, absolutely. I've been working on that project for a long time. It's going to be called Steppendoom, like Steppenwolf, but with the word doom instead of wolf. Uh, and it's basically a collaboration record uh, that I'm producing uh, where I, I composed the songs, played the drums and the bass, and then yeah hired all these uh, doom metal guitar players from all over the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, lots of great people like members from Neurosis, Sleep, Paradise Lost, etc., etc., etc. And then I've combined that doom metal music with throat, throat singers from Siberia, Tuva, Mongolia. And for those who don't know, throat singing is a technique uh, made of singing with overtones uh, you create different overtones, multiple tones at the same time with a specific technique in yeah. the throat. And I can't do myself, yeah. but I was fascinated by. And so I got in touch with the best throat singers in the world. Some of them are nomads. Some of them are people that live in cities. So it took a long time and it took translators and it took, 
you know, there were challenges of technology and things lost in translation, but the record is coming out great. Uh, uh, and I'm talking to a label right now. Yeah. I won't say the name because it's not official yet, but it's it's going to be out next year for sure. Yeah. Um, um, it really sort of, when I saw that, when, when we were looking at a bit of background, really fascinated me that you're doing that because I've seen videos of, uh, and heard recordings of those guys singing. And it's that's amazing to me that somebody can, I mean, I guess in layman's terms, harmonize with themselves <laughs> as they sing. It's something that's truly unique. I mean, I've, I've never really seen anything like it. <laughs> but... it's, it is unique. And like I said, I'm always so fascinated by it that I wanted to find a way to do something with it. Yeah. And so that's my way of paying tribute to that culture, but also to create kind of a cultural bridge between two, two uh, genres of music that have never been put together uh, to types of people uh, and by people I mean mu musicians but also listeners that usually don't you know don't mesh yeah. uh, so this is going to be a record that has something to offer to both the, the doom metal fans as well as the, as the world music fans yeah I'm really looking forward to it I guess one final question on it is just you mentioned some of the logistical challenges how did did you travel to them to record or did you bring people to you um, uh, well, a lot of a lot of it was actually done via the internet, simply yeah. because the distances involved. Yeah. I mean, the the musicians, the singers were in the most remote, more remote places of the world, like yeah. literally, Uva, Mongolia, Siberia, or literally, or <laughs> places in the world. Uh, so I did it. We we just used the internet. I we sent tracks around, and then. Uh, I, as the producer, uh, made sure that all the pieces fit and it worked my magic so that it comes out cohesive sounding and it sounds like we were all in, together in the same room. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to hear that one. I'm glad, I'm glad you're in touch with the label because I'll be, I'll be looking out for it when it arrives. Yeah, and it's going to have a yeah. really incredible packaging too. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Well, Mark, thanks so much for taking the time. It was really, really interesting. <laughs> thanks. No problem. Really, really great talking to you. And we'll, we'll put this up on the, the website. And um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I love uh, listening to stories like yours. I really, do. <laughs> I really do. Cool. Well, I'm glad I was helpful and uh, informative. And if you have any other questions, feel free. But mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me. No, no problem at all. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.